All right. Well, looking forward to getting to into the Word of God here this evening. So um, the message uh, this evening will be a little bit more like a Sunday school lesson, maybe, uh, than than a sermon. But it's it's gonna it's something I've really enjoyed studying, and um, it's uh, something just more of a, a something here today to help us put things in perspective and uh, life in general and whatever may be uh may be happening uh, just a just a reminder here tonight and uh this message is is part of a series of messages i did um a couple years ago and uh talking about our salvation giving us a proper understanding of our salvation what happened at salvation so what we're going to look at tonight is uh, we're actually going to go through several words, several words in the Bible uh, that teach us of some things that we got as a result of salvation. And when we got saved, it wasn't just a, uh, a get out of jail free ticket or, uh, or fire insurance. I've heard some people say it that way. And when you hear something like that, you have to cringe like, whoa, man, what did you just say? You're talking about salvation there. But um, it truly is an amazing event that occurs when someone gets saved. It's incredible. And we have a lot, there's a lot that God gives us that goes along with that. And, uh, and like I said, this uh, may be uh, mainly reminders for us here tonight, but uh, something to help. Uh, it helps me when I look at these, even uh, today and uh, yesterday, looking over this stuff again, and uh, just helps put life in perspective, helps me to to, uh, to think about things a little bit clearer. Uh, so the first one we're going to look at, I'll kind of, I'll kind of give you, uh, I'll give you the word, we'll, we'll, we'll define it, and then we'll look at what the Bible, uh, several uh, scripture references about, about each one of these. Uh, the first one that uh, we received at salvation is justification. We'll look at that. And justification is the act of justifying or showing to be just or conformable to the law. Uh, justification is the idea of being, uh, being made as if you have perfectly kept the law and you have nothing to be judged for. And uh, now we know that uh, as, we're all, as a result of sin, you know, we, we've broken God's law. Breaking God's law is sin. And we're, we're far from perfect. We're far from uh, uh, being able to meet God's requirement of perfection for salvation to be with God. And that's a state that each and every one of us are in, you know, before salvation. If we're not saved, uh, we haven't been able to keep God's law. And we're going to be judged of that one day. And, uh, and at that judgment, uh, we're going to be found, we're going to be found guilty. But one thing that comes as a result of salvation, it comes as a result of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's on the account of of the atonement of Christ is justification. You are justified to where you can stand before the judge and he can say, you are just. You have kept the law. Like, here's the law, and I can't see any, any part of the law that you have broken. You're justified. Let's look at uh, Acts chapter 13, first of all. Please turn with me to Acts chapter 13. We'll read verses 38 and 39. Acts chapter 13, verse 38 and 39. The Bible says here, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Here, the Apostle Paul is, is preaching to the Jews. They believed that they could be justified by following the law. They, they, they thought that they could follow the law good enough to be justified uh, in God's sight. And he's telling them here that you can't do that. You can't be justified by the law of Moses. Justification comes through believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's impossible to be justified any other way. We would have to be perfect, as we know. We would have to be perfect in order to, uh, in order to be justified in God's sight. This is an impossibility. It's impossible. Can't do it. There is no way to 
to, uh, to meet God's requirements. There's no way to appease the wrath of God that is on us in and of ourselves. This is, you know, it's, uh, it's something that is uh, it's not just difficult. Like I said, it's an impossibility, but it's something that Christ was able to give to us through salvation. Christ was able to make it as if we perfectly kept the law of God because he perfectly kept the law of God. And he, he took our sins for us and gave us his righteousness. Uh, Romans chapter 3 has a lot to say about this. Let's turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Uh, let's start reading in verse 19. book of Romans, of course, has a lot to say about salvation. And we will look at quite a bit in the book of Romans here tonight. But Romans chapter 3, verse 19 the uh, Bible says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and that the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You know, Romans here is teaching us, you know, the purpose of the law is to show us that, 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 that we're guilty. You know, God didn't give us the law so that we can, we can justify ourselves through the law, so that we can fulfill it. Uh, he gave us law really to one of the purposes of the law is to show us you can't do it. You, you can't do it, and that's not to, you know, don't uh, don't use that to say, well, you know, God gave me all these commands in His Word just just so I know I wouldn't have to do it, so I'm not even going to try. <laughs> that's a whole nother that's a whole nother topic to preach on. But uh, we certainly do want to be obedient to God's Word. But a big part of of, of the law that God had given, especially referring to the Old Testament law of Moses, is we, we can't do it. But, but God has made a way for us to do it through Christ. Uh, verse 24 of, uh, of well, let's, let's just, I'll just keep reading verse uh, 21 in Romans chapter 3, the next verse is, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So the righteousness of God here, it doesn't come through the law, it doesn't come through something that we do, it comes by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all, anyone, anyone who believes. So there's a lot of people in this world striving to meet God's requirements, striving to earn their way to heaven, striving to get to heaven, striving to live a life that is pleasing to God, and, and, but in, in a different way than what we do, in a way to, 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 to be able to earn heaven and to escape hell. It's a big burden. That's a big burden. <laughs> I just imagine, what, you know, how, would that, how would I feel if I felt as if I had to, you know, to do my best to perfectly follow, you know, everything, the commandments of God, or, or whether it be the commandments of a church, or, or traditions, or sacraments, or whatever it may be, or, or rituals, or, you know, I think of, uh, you know, the, the Islam religion, so much that they strive to do to please their God, and it's a burden on a lot, the ones who take it serious, you know, it's, um, it consumes their life, <laughs> and, and you could think of any kind of works-based religion. Well, Jesus Christ frees us from that through this justification, is by faith of Jesus Christ, just the faith alone in Jesus Christ, and it makes us free of that of that burden, and we are made just in in God's sight because we've been given the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ. As, uh, verse twenty four says, being justified freely by His grace through redemption that is in Jesus Christ. It's free. It's a free gift. You know, verse 28. So therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. This is something that we don't have to work for. So here's one great big thing, great thing that we get in salvation. We don't have to work our way to heaven, to earn our way to heaven. You know, we couldn't, even if we wanted to. But it's a free gift through the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so with all these things we have to worry about in the world, one thing you don't have to worry about is, am I going to be good enough to get to heaven when I die? You don't have to worry about that because of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of justification. So when things start getting really bad, well, I've got my salvation. I've got justified. <laughs> That's kind of what we're talking about here when we talk about keeping things in perspective. And uh, oh, it's, not, it's more than just 
you know, I guess I don't have anything else, but I've got salvation. Great. No, I mean, this is really big. <laughs> you know, this is something that will give, can give us joy no matter what circumstance. And uh, so hopefully we'll kind of, uh, we'll, we'll work towards that perspective here tonight. Uh, so justification is one. Uh, another one here is reconciliation. Reconciliation is the act of reconciling parties at variance. Reading from uh, the Webster's 1828 definition here. Uh, the renewal of friendship after disagreement or enmity. It's the means by which sinners are reconciled and, bought and brought into a state of favor with God after natural estrangement or, enemy, or enmity, the atonement. Uh, so atonement and reconciliation actually go hand in hand. They both mean agreement, basically. Uh, but reconciliation, this is the idea that before salvation, we were God's enemies. We were at enemies with God. And after salvation, we're reconciled, we're brought into agreement with God. So uh, it's restoring of our relationship. You can think all the way back to the Garden of Eden, to Adam and Eve. When they originally had that relationship with God and it was broken after sin. It, it was no longer there. They could not have that fellowship with God because of sin, because of what they had done against God. Well, salvation is a restoring of that relationship with God. It's a reconciliation. So through salvation, we can have a relationship with God. We can have a relationship with the one who made everything, the almighty, all-powerful creator, the one who loves us and died for us. We can have a relationship with him, a real, really, an everyday relationship. So we can go to God in, because, of, because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, as the book of Hebrews tells us, you know, we can come boldly before the throne of grace. We have prayer. We have prayer. We can go to God in prayer and bring these things to him. We have the Holy Spirit in us. This relationship with God you know, that involves the Holy Spirit is our comforter, our guide, our teacher, our friend, and the Holy Spirit it? as a result of salvation. As a result of this reconciliation, um, you know, this relationship that we have with God, we have someone that we can go to. With, you know, um, through so when you're going through a time of loss, brother uh, Greg and I were talking about this. Uh, James Baxter, he's going through this terrible time of loss right now with his friend, but he's able to to trust in God. He, he he's got a relationship with God that makes. Everything, it makes it possible to survive something as bad as that. That's because of salvation. We have that. We have that relationship with God, you know. And um, so that's reconciliation. We have that. And like I said, this uh, is very closely, close, the same idea as atonement. The same word is actually often translated as atonement in Scripture. It basically means agreement, a change from opposed to God to in agreement with God. Let's look at Romans chapter 5. It's probably right there on the same page or the next page is Romans 3, where we were at. But Romans 5, verse 10 and 11 says, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have received the atonement. So here we, Because we were justified by the by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are changed from being enemies of God under his wrath to being right with God and being saved by his life. So, I mean, that's a whole other aspect to recon reconciliation right there is when, we're, when we were enemies with God, we were under his wrath. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day, and the Bible talks so much about God's wrath building up against his enemies and how he is going to take vengeance on his enemies. That's the state that we were in before salvation. We were justly so under the wrath of God, and it was bound to be poured out on us. And, but, uh, but through reconciliation, through salvation, that has changed, completely changed. Our relationship with God now is totally different than what it was. We're no longer enemies, but we're now um, we're restored. We're reconciled with God. We're now friends, and even more than just friends, as we'll of course, get into with, as we go deeper into this, look into salvation. Uh, look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks a lot about reconciliation. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to start reading verse 18. It says, And all things are of God, 
who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ stead be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Reconciliation is made possible by Christ giving us his righteousness. Uh, by, you know, he, we were even made the righteousness of God in him. God can now be pleased with us because we have his own righteousness. You know, it's the reason why God, why our relationship is reconciled with God at salvation is not because of what we did, obviously. It's not because we did something to make God uh, all of a sudden pleased with us and happy as we did. We were good enough that God is now uh, able to have this relationship with us. No, it's because of his own righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. It was because of what Christ on the cross became our sin and, and made it so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. This is the reason for the reconciliation. Is God can be agreed with his own righteousness. <laughs> and that's, that's the requirement right there. Um, it, 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 like we said, it's that perfection. And because we have that on us through Christ, we can be reconciled with God. An interesting uh, aspect to reconciliation, too, is brought out in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Even beyond just our own relationship with God as far as like individuals and people, but even applied to, to creation, uh, Colossians chapter 1. And verse 20, just, just one verse here. Um, Colossians 1 and verse 20 says, and, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in the earth or things in heaven. Let's talk about God reconciling all things to himself. Romans also brings out the idea how, you know, one day creation is even going to be restored. All things one day are going to be restored to to right to how they were how they were originally intended to be, you know, and even better. And uh, you know, one, the whole earth one day will be in agreement, will be reconciled with God. That's a thought right there. How the whole earth will be in agreement with God someday. We certainly don't have that right now, <laughs> but uh, but one day, you know that that. That battle will be over with, and uh, and of course we know we know that's coming. It's coming soon. It looks like, <laughs> but uh, so uh, we look at justification, reconciliation. Another one here is regeneration. Regeneration is the act of producing a new, the new birth. Uh, regeneration is the spiritual change wrought in man by the Holy Spirit, by which he becomes the possessor of a new life. And this is different from justification. Justification and reconciliation, they deal with the change in our relationship to God. This is more, uh, more like a change in our moral and spiritual nature. You know, it's a, it's a new birth. It's a new life. It's a new spirit. Um, and, you know, all this happens at the same time as the point of salvation when you get saved. There's a lot going on there, you know. Justification, reconciliation, regeneration, and we're going to continue on down the list. But, um, so... This regeneration is, uh, you know, uh, in John chapter 3, we'll look at John chapter 3, is it's the new birth. You know, how Jesus Christ told Nicodemus here, you must be born again. Let's look at John chapter 3, uh, and we'll read a few verses there. John chapter 3, I'll just read verses 3. Through six here. So Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit, the Spirit. Marvel not, I say unto thee, you must be born again. Uh, so, you know, um, regeneration, obviously, this is something that is necessary for salvation. He says that you must be born again, um, and, but it's something that, that takes place at salvation. The 2 Corinthians 5.17 talks about how you're a new creature. Uh, in, in Christ, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. 
the spiritual birth occurs, you know, it's when the idea of uh, before salvation, our spirit is dead. We're separated from God. We know that, that definition there. That death means separation. We're separated from God. We're dead. But at salvation, we're no longer separated from God. You know, the, the Holy Spirit indwells us. And, and there's a new life there. There's a new life. We're made alive. And it's, it's, it's a new man that, that is there. Uh, look at, um, let's go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 talks about this, this new nature that is, that is received upon salvation. Brings out an interesting aspect of it here. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, let me just read verse 9. It says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Well, let me uh, stop there. But verse 9 here talks about how, you know, uh, whosoever is born of God doth not commit, commit sin. So through salvation and regeneration here, we're given a new nature, that cannot sin. It's an interesting thought right here. This new man, this 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 new uh, this new man that is born of God upon salvation, this new nature, this new spirit, can't sin. Impossible to sin. Uh, this is the basis of uh, one of the, one of the bases of eternal security right here. Why well, you can't lose your salvation? You, this this new nature here does not. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. You know this is obviously he's not saying that. You're not going to sin again after your salvation because you've still got that old nature. That old nature is going to sin. And, uh, but the new nature does not commit sin. So we have a new birth here. We have, we have regeneration. We have new life. We go from being dead to being alive through salvation. And uh, so uh, next one here to look at is sanctification. Sanctification, there's, there's a couple different aspects to this. There's a sanctification that occurs right at salvation, and then there's kind of an ongoing sanctification that's supposed to be happening too. Uh, but sanctification is the act of making holy, the act of consecrating or setting apart for a sacred purpose, which would be set apart for special service. It's, it's the same idea as, uh, as holy, like it's the act of making something holy. It's setting something apart for a, for a specific purpose or for a sacred purpose. That's the idea of sanctification. Uh, this is uh, brought out in the Old Testament with things like the tabernacle furniture in Exodus chapter 40. They were sanctified to be used. The candlestick and the, you know, and the, the, the furniture pieces there in the tabernacle, they were only for the tabernacle. Those were sanctified for that one specific purpose. Um, you know, the Bible talks about in Exodus 19, the mountain, Mount Sinai was sanctified. <laughs> it was set apart for the purpose of of God coming down and meeting with Israel right there at that particular time. Um, the Bible talks about food being sanctified, set aside for a specific purpose. So anything can be, can be sanctified. You can set a specific purpose on something. But at salvation, God gives us a purpose at salvation. He sanctifies us. He, he makes us holy. He gives us a, a specific uh, purpose set apart for Christ. Uh, Look at Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Great verse here for this familiar verse, but Titus 2, verse 14, is uh, talking about Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Uh, verse you're talking about how Christ wants to he wants us to be peculiar. That word peculiar there doesn't just mean strange. It actually is a very similar idea to sanctified. It's, it's for a specific purpose is what that means. Um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 through 13. Let me just read these verses uh, here quickly. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 12 and 13 says, Give, uh, giving thanks unto God. And giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us to the kingdom of his Son. One thing that is brought out, uh, I want to tie this into sanctification, one thing that is brought out repeatedly in the New Testament for Christians is we're part of God's family, part of God's kingdom. We're set apart in that way. We're become part of God's kingdom, part of God's family, but, and we're, we're given a purpose in that. 
So here's a, a, the, the idea that I want us to think of right now behind sanctification is God gives us a purpose. We have a purpose upon salvation. It's not, uh, you know, no longer do we, do, we, uh, do we have to live our lives and thinking about the end of our lives and was it worth it? Am I living for something that's worthwhile? Am I living for, am I, am I wasting my life? What's going to happen to my life? You know, of course, pastor's preaching through Ecclesiastes. It's a similar idea here. You know, Solomon is, had so much to say about what's going to happen to all his, all that he had accomplished after he died. Um, one thing we have through salvation, through this sanctification, we have a purpose now. We're now set apart for the Lord Jesus Christ to serve him and to, to do his will for our life. And it's something that is, is real. It's a real purpose and something that will have real reward and real value in, in, our, in our life. It's something that is worth living for. We now have that in salvation. We no longer have to wonder uh, if, if we're living for something worthwhile. If we live for the Lord, if we live for, uh, for if we obey, the, uh, obey God's word and, and do God's will in our life, it's worth it. That's a good purpose to live for. It will be eternally worth it. So that's uh, what we have through sanctification. And, of course, uh, you know, that's kind of the sanctification we receive uh, at salvation. But the Bible also talks about sanctification being practical Christian growth, putting away sin and putting on God's holiness, practical growth. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4 uh, just mentions this four verse three says uh, Paul here says for this is the will of God even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication so this is this is an active everyday ongoing thing as well you know sanctification abstain from sin and and live a sanctified life live a holy life live as if you are set apart for Christ and not for the things of the world. You're not, the purpose of your life is no longer to fulfill your own desires. It's no longer to fulfill what the world wants you to do or what your family wants you to do or what your boss wants you to do. The purpose of your life is to fulfill what God wants you to do. And uh, we have that through sanctification. And uh, just uh, quickly, I'll try to go through the last few here quickly, but at least try to mention them. Uh, next one is uh, redemption. And... Uh, this is this is a great one. Of course, redemption uh, uh, refers to the repurchase of captured goods or prisoners. In most cases, when this word is used, um, or the act of procuring the deliverance of persons or things from the possessions and powers of captors. Uh, of course, redemption in referring to salvation refers to uh, God purchasing us back through the death and the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, or you could also say it as the purchasing of God's favor through the suffering and death of the Lord Jesus Christ in that way. Um, you know, because we, had, we, have, we, we were under the bondage of sin we're, and we were bound to suffer the penalties of violating God's law, but we could be purchased from that, that captivity, if you will, from that end by the atonement of Christ. Colossians 1.14 says that Christ literally purchased us with his blood. Uh, let me read that verse here. Colossians 1 verse 14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. This is also mentioned in Acts chapter 20 and 1 Peter chapter 1, that Christ purchased us with his blood. And, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 brings out the idea that because we are purchased with so great a price, uh, you know, uh, we, we need to glorify God with our bodies, you know, with everything that we have. Glorify God because we were bought by him. We were bought with the price. And also this presents us with the idea is that, of course, that we have value. We have value to God. Um, you know, God, he chose to purchase us. With it. I, and often I look at myself and I think, where's the value, God? <laughs> Why did you do that? <laughs> Why would you go to such great extent to purchase a, a sinner? or let alone a whole world of multitudes and multitudes of sinners. Why would you do that? But God had value in that. God desired to do that. It was, a, it was of his own will that he chose to do that. And it's, um, that's, that's a good thing to, to remember, is the value that God puts on us. And, you know, along with the idea that we are not our own, that we are God's. 
And, the, you know, the, the, the world and the devil will attempt to put a value on you. They'll attempt to show you that they value. The devil will show you, will try to deceive you and show you that he values you and that he desires your happiness. The world and people who have a world, uh, you know, the worldly minded people, they will attempt to show you that they value you and that they, they desire your happiness. But it's not true. It's a lie. But in God, he, God really does value us. And because of that type of value that we have is not something that will give us um, uh, self-esteem, as the, word, as the world likes to call it. Um, it. Rather, it will give us Christ esteem. It will cause us to esteem Christ above ourselves and above all else because of the value that he put on us. And instead of lifting us up with pride, it will cause us to lift up Christ in that. But redemption here, and of course, uh, Romans 8, 22, verse 23 talks about how all of creation even waits for redemption to be complete when the Lord Jesus Christ receives back control of the earth and restores things as they should be, as he will, as it's detailed in the book of Revelation, that, that process of that happening. And um, so re redemption, another great gift that we have through salvation. And uh, I'll just mention uh, the la I've got three more on my list here. I'll just mention these briefly and uh, just touch on them. But uh, adoption, one of the Bible talks about how we are adopted. And uh, adoption, you know, to take a stranger into one's family as a son, as a heir. Uh, to take one who is not a child, but to treat him as one. Giving him one, the, giving a, a title and to the privileges and rights of a child. Uh, you know, placed into God's family as a son, or adopted into God's family. So not only do we have the rights of being born into God's family, but also the rights of being adopted into God's family and receiving the inheritance of privilege. It's like, you know, um, it's, it, it refers to two different types of gifts, two different types of blessings that God gives us on two different aspects in salvation. Um, God gives us these rights and privileges, these inheritances that go along with that. And... Um, you know, First John, First John chapter three and John chapter one talk about how he gives us his name. He gives us his name. We were called after after his own name. And uh, Galatians four talks about how we're made the sons of God through adoption, heirs of God through Christ. And the inheritance the Bible talks about this in Ephesians and Galatians, inheritance of eternal life, of ruling and reigning with Christ, the result of adoption. Of course, all the result of salvation. And uh, election is the next one. That uh, is a result of salvation. God elects Christians to service. I'm not talking about God elects some to heaven and some to hell. Of course not. But um, God chooses those who have received Jesus Christ as their, as their Savior. He chooses them to salvation because they receive Christ. And he chooses them to a purpose, to service. And Ephesians uh, 1 tells us, you know, we're elected to be holy, to be without blame in love, to be adopted to God, to, to live to the praise and the honor of glory of his grace. So these are things that we are elected to as a result of salvation. And, of course, um, this is the last one I have on my list here, a very obvious one, but what we receive as a result of salvation is eternal life, everlasting life. And we have that right now, another basis here for um, for uh, security of uh, the, our eternal security here. We have salvation, or we have eternal life right now as a result of salvation. It's not something we get in the future. You already have it. And, uh, but we have eternity. We have eternal life now because of it. We're going to live with Christ in eternity. And, um, of course, there's a lot you can say about that, but that will definitely help you to put life in perspective when you think that, man, this world I'm living in here is just going to be, I'm just going to be here for a very short, short, short time, just a drop in the bucket compared to what's to come. And, and I can live for, live for God forever in heaven. That will, that will greatly affect how we live. So just ho hopefully some reminders here, some help us to keep uh, life in perspective because of this great salvation that we have, that God has given us. So just praise the Lord for all that he's done for us. We certainly do not deserve it, but uh, think about these things uh, as you go throughout your week, what you have in salvation. And, uh, Brother Greg, I think I'll turn the service back over to you now. Salvation, how great a, great a gift. Um, use it and live like you have it. Uh, the world depends on us. We're in this time of difficulty, and, and what a strength. 
uh, what a strength we have in Jesus Christ. It's, it's amazing. Uh, we'll just go ahead and we'll pray, spend a little time praying here, and uh, 